Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest today is Ramdas Batchelder. And Ramdas is this is the first interview I will have conducted with somebody in India. He's in Tiruvannamalai, which is famed, of course, as the place where Ramana Maharshi hung out for many, many years. Um, Ramdas came to my attention about a year ago when he sent me a copy of his book, which is entitled Rising in Love, My Wild and Crazy Ride to Here and Now. So I read it, and uh, I really enjoyed it and ended up feeling inspired to write the introduction to it, or maybe he asked me to write the introduction, I don't know. So we went back and forth quite a bit, and I ended up writing the introduction. Um, so we're going to be talking about his book, which is basically about his life, and primarily about his life with Amma, the hugging saint, as she's sometimes called. Her official name is Mata Amritananda Mai Devi, and you see a picture of her behind my right shoulder, and you also see a picture of her behind Ramdas's right shoulder. Um, he lives in her ashram in India, and I've never visited there, but I've been, my wife and I, I, I have been seeing Amma since 1999 here in the States, and have really benefited tremendously from, from that experience. Um, so here's a little bit about Ramdas, first of all. Uh, he was born in Pennsylvania in 1961, had a spiritual awakening in his early 20s, and has spent most of the last 25 years in India as a devotee of Amma. He has written four children's books, which have been translated into several European languages, and also a novel in rhyming verse, full three, three full-length plays, and 40 original songs. In 2012, he and his wife, Tarini Ma, wrote and co-taught a university course on Hinduism in Venezuela. She's from, his wife is from Venezuela. He has given numerous talks and workshops about various aspects of spirituality in many locations around the world. He and his wife are currently offering five-star tours of the sacred cities of India to both Spanish and English-speaking groups. Um, his book, Rising in Love, tells the story of his... Well, I, I'll probably just... This is a long introduction about the book. I think we'll just let you talk about the book rather than me reading this whole thing. Um, it goes from a powerful mar marijuana-fueled spiritual awakening in America, which included meeting an angel, uh, two years struggle with delusion and addiction, subsequent renunciation of drugs, and eventual discovery of Amma, um, and it covers about 27 amazing years uh, in your life during which you've been seeking enlightenment as Amma's devotee, most of that time in India. So where would you like to start? It's about a year since I've read the book, and um, I started reading it again last night and immediately got drawn into it again. It's a very interesting story, and you're a good writer. Um, but, you know, we have an hour and a half, two hours here to give people a sense of what the book is about, what you're about, and what Amma's about. So where would you like to start? Did you hear all that, Ramdas? Well... Okay, good. You're, you're just pausing <laughs> for thought. <laughs> Incidentally, Ramdas is somewhat deaf from having had his ears blown out at a rock concert. Why that didn't happen to me, I don't know, but he, he's hearing me okay. I'm hearing you pretty good so yeah. far. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I guess the best place to start is just a few words about Amma, because she's definitely the main focus of the book. Mm -hmm. um, those who don't know Amma, she's known as the Hugging Saint because she travels all over the world giving programs of free hugs. And uh, these programs go on for 12, 14, 16, 18 hours, sometimes more. And rather often, she does a bath break during that entire time. Yeah, your, and, your voice um, broke up a little bit, but you said she doesn't take a bathroom break during that entire time. Yes, she generally well, doesn't. When she gives Devi Baba programs, mm -hmm. in the West she gives a special program. So she'll give hugs all day long, mm -hmm. and then a special program during the night. Uh, and this, this program will start at about 10, 11 a.m. the next morning when she's hugging well, approximately what, 20,000 people or something. And um, during those programs, all night long programs, which could be 18 hours, she does not take a bathroom break. Yeah. So there's something rather hu uh, superhuman, I think, about, about what she's doing. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, I mean, and even if she did take bathroom breaks, I mean, I've witnessed this whole thing many times. She, she kind of moderates her liquid intake so as to not need so many bathroom breaks. But still, even if she took them, uh, there's something remarkable about what... You, you feel like you're witnessing some kind of miracle because, you know, you, you picture yourself being in that situation, sitting on a couch without, without really going anywhere for that many hours, hugging, you know, thousands of sweaty 
crying people. <laughs> and you think, I would have run out of steam so long ago. And she still reacts to each new person as if they were the, their, her long lost you know, friend that she's so happy to see. Totally. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's, in my experience, it's definitely not just a hug. It's direct contact with the divine. Yeah. Now, I know, I know not, everybody, not everybody will see Ama in the same way I do. And there's nobody insisting that anybody see Ama in one way or another. Um, that's what, one thing I like about the organization is that you can come and meet Ama and have any opinion you want. Your experience is your experience and nobody's insisting that you see Ama one way. But in my experience, she's a divine incarnation. And uh, there's, a, the, there's a certainty that she's knowing my every thought. And that even if she's on the other side of the globe, she's hearing my every thought. And she's hearing this conversation now, even though her body's a thousand miles away. So that's my experience of Amma for many, many years. Mm. And it, it enables an extraordinary level of communication where um, I know if I have a question, she can answer me from inside my own mind uh, immediately. And of course, she sometimes makes me wait a little bit, but that's another matter. But there's a sense that I'm, that, that I'm really dealing with an all-pervading, omniscient being of, of infinite love, um, not a human being. Hmm. Well, you've had a lot more exposure to it than I have. Let's, let's um, first of all, deal with this point you just made, which is it's not just some hu a hug, which when I first heard about it, sounded sort of nice and touchy-feely and, you know, boy, she, it's, it's like there was, it used to be this guy named Leo somebody rather in the U.S. who's trademarked thing. Huh? Yeah, yeah, right, Biscaglia, who, who used to yeah. hug a lot of people. And I kind of put it in that category. But then when we actually went to see her, yeah. you know, I mean, most people listening to this will be familiar with the word darshan. Uh, when I actually went to, we, went, we actually went to see her and, you know, had this experience, it was so far beyond the physicality of getting a nice warm oh. hug for a few seconds. Yeah. I mean, something really profound happens in the kind of inner dimensions mm -hmm. of one's life. Totally, yeah. No, it's, it's for me, it's direct communion with, with God. And, and you know, um, an embrace from the omniscience and omnipresence of, of the divine. Mm -hmm. So it's not an ordinary hug by any means. Yeah. Now, you know, the other aspect of Ama, which is undeniable, is that she's one of the world's greatest humanitarians. So that even if somebody isn't ready to see that she's a saint or the won't want to have be told that she's a divine incarnation, we can certainly look at her charitable mission and, and realize that she's doing incredible work for the poor. And um, this includes 45,000 houses that the ashram has built for uh, the victims of the tsunami and the, the earthquake in Gujarat. And um, they now recently have built 5,000 more houses up in North India where the flood was last year. And it includes uh, 50 K through 12 schools and a, one of the best hospitals in India, which gives a lot of free surgeries for the poor. And something like 10, 000, 10 million free meals a year in India. Um, uh, uh, pensions for 100,000 widows, which keeps these women from falling into the sex trade or from starvation. Um, and that's just the beginning. They have these many, many programs which reach out into, into the Indian uh, countryside to uplift women who are in rural areas and give them vocational training. Uh, they have programs to prevent farmer suicides. The, the huge fund that she's created to support the children of farmers and help them go to school. And um, I'm, I'm sure I'm missing about 20 different projects because she's, her outreach is just huge. Oh, you're missing, more, you're, you're missing more than 20, because if you actually read a list of all the projects, it would probably right. take you 15 minutes just to read the list. I mean, there, there right. are so many things that she does, and, uh, yeah. or that are done in her name. And, you know, and they're not just token things where some announcement is made and then nothing happens, but, you know, stuff, yeah. is, stuff actually happens. <laughs> Lots of stuff. Oh, it's, an excellent, it's an excellent charitable organization. Yeah. They have like, special UN status as being uh, in a very effective charitable service, so people are, are requested to donate there. And one of the good things about it is that um, all, the, all the work is done by volunteers, so there's no salary bleed, you know, and some of the, some of the charitable organizations, the, the people running it get a million dollar salary, right. so your donation is going there. Whereas with AMA, uh, I would think 99.9% .9 of it is going directly to the service of the poor, so it's quite impressive what they do. Yeah. Um. 
let's, let's talk a little bit more about the actual darshan experience, this hug, so to, so, so to speak, um, and our subjective experience of it. Because my subjective experience is as if, it's as if, I mean, first of all, initially there's this experience of kind of like sinking into the vastness, like Am is this kind of vast ocean of consciousness, and that, you know, and we all are essentially, but it's usually occluded to some extent. But when I'm having darshan, it, it it becomes much more clear. There's a kind of a, a mind meld, so to speak, you know, an entrainment, and one, f one kind mm -hmm. of, uh, one becomes much more consciously vast oneself. Mm -hmm. uh, but secondly, I really feel like I'm a kind of, like you said, knows your thoughts, knows your, your, your innermost core, and kind of like is sitting at the master switchboard in such a way that when, when you have that interaction with her, she pushes a few buttons on that master switchboard and, and literally changes the course of your life in, in very significant yeah. ways. Ad, adds a very powerful evolutionary engine to your train. Oh, I fully agree. Now, there's a sense that there's each, each, each of these darshans is a, is a karmic cleansing, which is, enables me to move forward and reach a whole new level, which, I, you know, which was not available even the day before. There's a definitely a an acceleration with each each bit of contact I have with her. Each time I see her, there's a there's a blessing. Yeah. I have to um, admit that I I don't totally have the same faith you do in terms of uh, her omniscience at all times. Like that she's actually listening to this conversation, or you know knows what I had for breakfast this morning, or anything like that. Uh, I sort of feel like she's more like a a searchlight which can shine at any particular thing that needs illuminating, but that's not sort of illuminating everything 360 degrees all the time. I'm, I'm not sure that that would be either practical for her or for us or, or anything, but um, maybe you could comment on that. We can bounce that back and forth a few minutes. Yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, everybody's, everybody has their own perspective on who Ama is and their own experience of what she is, and, and it's perfectly okay. Everybody has their own their own way of understanding Amma, and it's, that's perfectly okay. It should be that way. Mm -hmm. I can tell you my own, it's like my experience of Amma is that she's literally, it's like a goddess in disguise. And so there's the outer disguise of a woman who's just very sweet and compassionate and loving, and maybe she's just a, a very sweet lady. <laughs> and she may pretend not to know what you, you know, not to know who you are or not to know the person who's next to you or something, or you ask her a question and you may get an answer which makes it seem like she didn't really know what you're talking about or something. But what I've come to experience, I mean, for many, many years is that, you know, if I ask her a question, she might initially give an answer which seems to not even have to do with the question or maybe she didn't really understand the question and then 10 seconds later I'll realize oh my god she just showed me that she knew absolutely everything about the the whole situation yeah. it's 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 difficult to explain but my my conception is is just that right behind that human form is literally the goddess of the universe so you know they some people talk about her as being kali incarnated Kali, meaning the supreme power, the mother of the entire universal play. And so this is, this is my direct experience, is that really beneath that disguise is the supreme reality that is the author, producer, and director of the entire cosmic movie. And not a leaf in the entire universe has moved except by her will, by the will of Kali, by the will of Parashakti. And this is, this is to me, what is embodied in Amma. She is Parashakti in the fullness, and she is also Brahman. She's the supreme reality of just pure awareness. So she's absolutely, for me, she's all levels of the divine embodied in a human disguise. And the disguise is very thick because after all, she's hugging millions of people from all walks of life, including um, alcoholics and murderers and prostitutes and whoever shows up. So she, she can't, you know, she says at one point, she was talking about Devi Bhava, which is this program where she puts on the crown of, of Devi and and the costume of the goddess and gives darshan in that form. And she was saying, um, if Amma showed herself as she truly is, no one would be able to come near. So what she's doing in Devi Bhava is just removing one or two veils of the many veils that are covering her true being. So that she, she shines a little more light. But um, if she were to take off all her veils, I mean, we'd be beholding the a blazing goddess in front of us, and who among us would be able to come and give her a hug? It's just too, too powerful what she is. 
Yeah. But that's my experience. That's my conception of Amen. That's my experience of Amen. Is that we're really talking about the supreme reality on all levels in a human disguise. Yeah. And um, and I've experienced that with Devi Baba too. That it's it's like you know the whole time you've been with Amma for a few days. It's like you're sitting around the nice warm oven or something, and then all of a sudden at the end it turns into a blast furnace. And, yeah. you know, and it's like this, whoa, you know, who is this? Yeah. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, and I think people listening to this show will be familiar with the concept of avatars. And it's said that there are, you know, different avatars are different degrees of, of fullness of the divine in their, in their manifestation or in mm -hmm. their embodiment. So, for instance, uh, Ram and his and his brother were said to be avatars. Maybe there were four brothers, weren't there? Uh, but you know, the second brother, Lakshman, I think, was half of the avatar that Ram was, and then the other two brothers were each a, a quarter. And but Ram was more full. And then Krishna was supposed to be way fuller than Ram, and sort of, according to this mythology, according to this tradition. Yeah. Um, and so, if we believe in the concept of avatars, and um, then we can conceive of different avatars having different degrees of expression of the, the divine. Um, you want to comment on that? Well, sure. I mean, um, I can't say I take all of that too seriously, um, but at the same time, if, if I had to say, is Ama a born avatar, a full incarnation? I would say absolutely. Uh -huh. That this is, a, a, in my opinion, in my experience, this is a full incarnation of the Divine Mother. Yeah. Uh, and the Divine Mother, you know, in Hinduism is not is different than in Christianity, where the Divine Mother is kind of an intermediary. She's not quite God. She's, you know, an intermediary between man and God. That's the Mother Mary. But in Hinduism, the Divine Mother is the source of the entire cosmic movie. Mm -hmm. And she's also a form of Brahman, the supreme reality. So she's, you know, they call it Parabrahma Swarupini, is, is the, the Divine Mother that is the form of Brahman. So this is what I see in Amma, is that she is Parashakti incarnate in, the, in, in a very full way. It's, it's interesting, one little story I tell in the book is when I first came to Amma's ashram. I had heard somebody say that, oh, maybe Amma was the reincarnation of Sri Ramakrishna, who was also considered to be an avatar. And I was reading the, the, the names of uh, the 108 names of Amma that, that one devotee had written. And there were several which seemed to refer to Amma uh, as if she has the qualities of Sri Ramakrishna and reminds us of Sharada Devi. And um, I was like, you know, the, in, the, in the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, there's a little story where a woman of impure character touches his feet and he leaps up as if he was stung by a bee and cries out. And, you know, Amma is hugging as I said before, prostitutes and murderers and alcoholics and, you know, all kinds of people of so-called impure character. And for her, it's all the same. So, so I, it was really hard for me to say, oh, yeah, this is the Sri Ramakrishna reincarnated. I, I really didn't believe it. And I asked one of the swamis, just, just you know, is Amma the reincarnation of Sri Ramakrishna? And he simply said no. <laughs> and, and I was like, oh, that's good. At least I don't know what he meant by that. But what I understood was, that no, Amma is, is the Divine Mother herself. I mean, Ramakrishna was a devotee of the Malakali. And the only way I could think of Amma as being a reincarnation of Ramakrishna would be if when Ramakrishna left the body, he merged completely in Kali, which is quite likely. Mm -hmm. And then it is that Kali as Ramakrishna, Ramakrishna as Kali, who has taken birth as Amma. Because mm -hmm. to me, it is very clear Amma is nothing less than the goddess of the universe in a human form. Mm -hmm. I could not, I cannot limit her greatness in any way. That's my, that's my experience. <laughs> yeah. One time uh, at a program, I was standing by Amma's couch and some reporter was interviewing her and, and you know, they were, the reporter was asking her how she manages to go on like this, you know, so many hours doing this. And she said, well, you know, if, if you work in a factory, you can only work so many hours and you get tired and you want to go home. She said, but if you're the owner of the factory, you could stay there any amount of time because it's your factory. So, so she said, this is my factory, you know, meaning, <laughs> meaning the whole the whole humanity is, you know, my, I own it. I, 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 I engulf, I encompass it. It, it, it it's within me. And so she gives, she gives many little clues that, that actually she's an embodiment of God, but at the same time, she's very subtle about it. And she really prefers not to make any kind of declaration.
declaration. She does not get up and say, I am an avatar or I am God. She never does that. She, if she says anything, it's I'm the servant of everybody. Um, you know, um, she calls everyone my children. And there was, I think, um, one interview where, where um, someone was comparing her with Ramana Maharshi. And she said, you know, Ramana Maharshi lived in a cave for most of his life and worked closely with maybe 300 people mm -hmm. during his lifetime. Uh, Ama is working with literally millions of people of all walks of life. So if you want to compare Ama with anyone, compare Ama with Lord Krishna. She said that? Yeah. Uh -huh. Now, I, I can hear a question forming in the minds of viewers right now. They're saying, yeah, but, you know, Mar Ramana Maharshi is sort of famous for having actually and caused a wave of enlightenment where a lot of his followers and their followers uh, are actually waking up in, in terms yeah, yeah. of enlightenment. Or, and um, I'm wondering how, and so, but Amma is sort of seeing millions of people. Is there any sort of loss of quality amidst, due to the quantity, you know, where she's uplifting millions of people a little bit, but not necessarily bringing people to a state of enlightenment? And I actually asked uh, her... Uh, her assistant uh, Swami Swamini Krishnamrita about this one time, and you know, if, if Hwayama doesn't talk a whole lot about people getting enlightened, uh, and she said, "Well, you know, not that many people do. It's a very rare thing, and you know, maybe upon your your death, uh, you, you'll you'll actually awaken." And I, you know, I haven't quite reconciled that because I talk to people all the time who I don't think are I don't I wouldn't use the word enlightened because I think that's mm -hmm. a very has a very superlative ultimate connotation, but who are experiencing profound degrees of awakening, which are abiding, which are stable, uh, you know, which don't mm -hmm. come and go. Mm -hmm. So how would you, how would you address that? Well, first of all, I have the utmost love and, and, and uh, respect for Ramana Maharshi and, and his disciples. I love him very much. He's been a very important pole star of truth for my life. And he's a case and in I'll point, by the way, because obviously we could use other examples. Yeah, yeah. sure. And I, I mean, I love his teachings. In fact, that's really the, the focus of my own meditation. Mm -hmm. So I certainly mean no disrespect there. Um, I love Ramana. Um, but I think the, the main point is, what I would say is, you know, uh, if, you looked, if you talked about Ramana's, uh, if you talked to him while he was alive, there wouldn't, you wouldn't have seen many enlightenments. Right. So I think you would have to give Ama 50 years, right? You look after, <laughs> when Ama leaves the body 50 years after, you might find 500 uh, people who have attained enlightenment through her teachings and through her grace. Um, I think that's quite possible. Um, I, I, you know, I personally feel, but by her grace, I am moving very rapidly towards enlightenment mm -hmm. uh, for what that's worth. So um, I don't think there's any limit on what Ama's grace can do. Um, I'm, I also, you know, hold Ramana in very high esteem. Mm. I, I also, you know, put a bit of a question mark around some of the so-called enlightenments that we see now. Among so many people giving satsang and um, quite a number of them don't look to me like they're really enlightened at all. But I mean, you know, I, I don't know. I don't mean to judge. But um, I say, well, let's, let's give Ama time. I mean, while she's, she's still in the body, she might have another 20 years in the body or more. So let's see. I think there probably there will definitely be some enlightened disciples. I don't know how many, but mm -hmm. I, um, it's not just a superficial huggy buggy, uh, <laughs> you know, organization that's just about being nice to people and doing charitable work. There, she's definitely is focused on God realization. Yeah. Um, actually, I'm, just I'm yes. I'm sorry. Go ahead. What were you gonna say? I, I'm definitely planning on attaining it if it's all, at all possible. Okay. And I, and I really feel very, very confident and very, very happy with the grace that's going in that direction. Yeah, I'll hold you to that. Um, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> just yesterday, I actually happened to be watching a little bit of an uh, interview with Papaji that David Godman did, you know, Papaji, and he, he was he's one of most, Ramana's most famous disciples, even though he didn't spend a lot of time with him. But he was saying that all these people that, you know, awaken, quote unquote, in his presence and then go back to the West are really kind of just getting started. And he was a little bit upset about how much hubris some of them show in, in proclaiming their, their awakening and their enlightenment and so on. He, he's yeah. really, he said he's really sending them out as spokespeople, not really as yeah. full-blown representatives of what's possible. Right. 
But the problem with that, I mean, I love Papaji also and spent four months with him and had a powerful experience with him. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but the, the problem with, 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 with some of that is that almost like the word enlightenment gets watered down so it doesn't really mean anything anymore. Yeah. And you have people claiming enlightenment and giving satsang and putting on a whole guru show and they're not enlightened at all and they don't embody any of the divine qualities. So I would rather have a guru who, who will, will, will not encourage a false declaration of enlightenment and not send out people, yes, you're enlightened, go tell everyone and start giving satsang and then have these little disasters happening all over the place and everybody giving up on enlightenment just because it, it starts to get a bad, a bad uh, odor, the right. whole concept, you know? Yeah. So I would rather have a, a fully God-realized master who insists that there's not going to be any display of false ego or no false gurus. I mean, the one thing I've prayed for is to never let me be a false guru. Mm -hmm. I'd much rather be a sincere disciple than a false guru. Beautiful. Yeah, and what we've been talking about the last couple of minutes, I think, brings up a very important point about Amma uh, and about the whole Enlightenment scene, which is that um, Amma is very strong on really culturing personalities, you know, not, not just sort of like um, eliciting some profound inner experience and you could still be a jerk in, your, in terms of your comportment, but, right. uh, but actually refining and culturing and, and working out all the, all the quirks that, you know, that we're all inflicted by and, and so that you ultimately will come out as, you know, really a saintly person, a shining example of, of, of uh, full possibility of what it means to be human rather than just someone who might still have a lot of ego and be and have had some kind of inner awakening and got, and hop up on the satsang dais. Right. right. Yeah, I, I agree. She's working very hard to weed out all the little weeds in all the characters that are, that are around her. And any, you know, any flaw, she's going to find a way to point it out and remove it and challenge the ego in all of its aspects until there's nothing left. Mm. And this is a long process, and, and you know I don't imagine it's an easy process, but I'm grateful for it. I, it, it. There's something really cool about being in that ashram because I'm surrounded by people who are in many ways superior to me in one aspect or another, and so there's a kind of a, a I'm always inspired to do better, to become better. Yeah, which actually leads to my next question, which is what is it like in the ashram? I mean, you know, I, I know, and sometimes in spiritual groups, it's kind of crazy. Everybody's uh, purifying like crazy and uh, unstressing, yeah. we used to call it in the TM movement. And, and there's all kinds of like strange frictions and obsessive idiosyncratic behaviors. And it's kind yeah. of like a, a nut house, you know. Uh, yeah. b b so is it kind of like that or maybe part of it's like that, but there are a lot of much more mature spiritual aspirants. And so there's really a kind of a holy atmosphere or all of the above or what? Well, I, I think it's probably all of the above, and, and each person coming to the ashram is going to have their own experience. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, my experience of the ashram, first of all, I really love it there. It's really a home for me. It's, I feel like I have a beautiful family, beautiful friends there. And when Amma is there, it's like a heaven realm for me. Every day, you know, I go up and sit next to Amma, even if it's only for two minutes, and I pass her the candies that she's giving to the devotees, and there's a beautiful two minutes of extraordinary communion. It may be very deep silence, uh, no mind space of just be of oneness with her. Um, but this is extremely sweet. I mean, it's just the nectar of, of devotion. It's like Radha and Krishna for even if it's only for two minutes. And then I also sit on stage with her and that usually it, um, it's supposed to be a half an hour, but usually I try to sneak back and get another half an hour. <laughs> and um, and this is, I mean, to sit on stage with her, this is a heaven realm for me. And um, the, just the, the extraordinary bliss of, you know, the closer you get to her physically, I mean, this is sometimes my experience, it's like she's a giant sun of love and bliss and peace. And the closer you get, then she's radiating that into you and just filling your entire being with this love and this bliss. And I mean, the whole body gets filled with this divine energy. And, yeah. and also, you know, I'm, I'm having, in the last couple of years, I've been having fairly consistent samadhi experiences mm -hmm. in my meditation. And so uh, these days, it's like three times a day I'm, I'm going into meditation and I'm just really blossoming within like 10 minutes into samadhi. Mm -hmm. So 
So this is incredible. I mean, what a grace that is to have that kind of bliss and peace at will is incredible because I, you know, I have been trying for 25 years. And uh, I met Amma actually 27 years ago, and I have watched this steady progression of trying, trying one form of meditation after another, after another, and all the sufferings and strugglings and, you know, big problems with lust and big problems with uh, all kinds of stuff uh, going on. And ashram politics and a lot of headaches and, and you know, coming to a place now where there is this, this samadhi is happening. It's like, oh my God, this is incredible. I'm so happy with Anna's grace. It hasn't been something that was given instantly. It's not like she gave me a pill. I've seen the 27 years of, of evolution, but it's incredible. I'm so grateful. So when you say samadhis are happening, what, what's actually happening? And how, how long do you sit there and what actually is going on? Well, it's a little bit hard to explain it, of course, but um, I'm getting into a space which is... I'm entering this space which is prior to the mind. Um, I, I had a very, very cool epiphany a couple of years ago, um, which was, I think I was on Facebook that I saw some post about how the, the atom, a physical atom, is like 99.9999999% space. It's almost nothing there but space. Right, it's like a pea in the middle of a, a baseball stadium and the electrons are running around the edges of the stadium like that. Exactly, right. exactly. And, so it's, and I thought to myself, I bet the I thought is the same thing. It's completely empty. And the, the, uh, you know, the, the illusion of the I thought as being something solid, as being the root of I'm the thinker of, of this person, it's, it's nothing but an illusion, and, and it just occurred to me uh, that what the I thought is full of is actually Brahman. It's pure silence, it's pure awareness, untouched by the thought I. That's the innermost essence of the thought I. And um, this was in, in Amma's presence when this kind of dawned on me, and I had a kind of a, 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 you know, a bright moment of thousands of light bulbs going off in my head and discovering, oh my God, right inside me all the time is the supreme reality hiding within the I thought. And of course, it's not limited by the I thought. It's subtler. It's infinite. It's always here and it's always the supreme reality. Oh my God, that is what I am. And so I've been able now to, you know, you, I have been working with the contemplation for many, many years that gradually takes me into a, into a state, uh, into the state of abiding in that pure silence. And it's just become much more simple now. It's become a, ra a radically simpler where I'm able to enter into that space, into the innermost essence of the thought I, and watch the I thought fall away. Mm -hmm. Because in that, in that pure awareness, there is no I thought. It exists prior to the I thought. It's, what, it's what's prior to the thought I. And therefore, in that space of pure awareness, there's no one to perceive anything. All perception hangs on the eye that perceives. And so without that perceiver, the whole realm of perception falls away. The whole realm of thought and imagination falls away because there's no one to think and no one to imagine. So it falls away. There's no one to do anything. There's no one to make any effort. So all effort and all doing falls away and nothing remains but pure being. And then, you know... There's an energetic component to this that, that manifests as if it's as if the, the mind is like um, a closed lotus. And as I open up into that silence, the mind opens up like this and a tremendous amount of energy starts filling my body and it comes out. It's like radiating in all directions, up and down and inside and back. And it's just like I'm being fully opened up and there's like nobody there. And it is so sweet. And the energy just, it's like, it's, it's as if the energy, like the mind blocks the energy. And when the, when the mind is, is opened up like this, the energy flows without any obstacle. And it's extraordinary. It's just amazing. And I, I feel like, oh my God, my body's just radiating this, this bliss in all directions. And it's a very, very sweet piece. It's a very sweet bliss. Nice. I heard a quote from the Tao Te Ching the other day, which said something like, uh, make all things orderly before they arise. And, uh, and then there's a quote from the, from the Gita that goes, uh, established in yoga, perform action. So do you find that having had this samadhi experience, 
several times a day, that um, it's totally lost when you get into activity, or is there a newfound orderliness and coherence to the to your activity, which maybe hadn't been there before you were experiencing this samadhi thing? Well, it's been you know it's been a gradual, gradual progression. So on the one hand, I think that definitely, definitely, the meditation over the years has totally given me. Uh, a lot more it's, uh, mental clarity mm -hmm. and a certain skill with certain things um, that's kind of extraordinary. But what I cannot claim, wish I could, but I cannot claim that I'm 24-7 established in the state of pure awareness. And the, mm -hmm. no, I mean, that's not yet where I'm at. Where I'm, at. Right. So I'm certainly not claiming that. But, but definitely there is an increasing level of peace in my life. There's mm -hmm. an increasing level where something may happen that would have previously caused me agitation and now it's just almost like nothing. Yeah. So that's a very sweet feeling, but I can't claim yet that, um, that I don't have my moments of agitation. Uh, maybe, I, maybe it's not necessary to claim that, but, but I, I'm not claiming enlightenment. I sure wish I could. No, that's all right. But, I know you're not. Yeah. Uh, I'm just yeah. wondering about the impact of it on your, on your active life, you know. Well, I think it's, it's that the peace that I'm discovering very, very fully in meditation is definitely soaking in and does permeate, but it, it's just this, you can't claim it's 100% now. Eventually, this whole, this whole damn structure is going to crumble and there's nothing, going to be nothing left but that peace, because that's the reality. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you probably see this in India, but traditionally how they dyed cloth, would they dip it in the color and then bleach it in the sun, then dip it in the color and bleach it in the sun. Keep doing that repeatedly and it would, yeah. every time it sat in the sun it would get less and less bleached until the point where it became, it retained its color as much as in the sun as, mm -hmm. it, as it was in the dye. Um, so, you know, it's a, there's a culturing process that has to take place, right? Yeah, definitely there's, I, you know, I don't know what the best metaphor for it is, I have to tell you when I actually attain enlightenment. But um, I think it's, I feel like it's almost like a, any structure of ego that remains just finally collapses and nothing remains but the supreme being, which is just pure awareness, mm -hmm. peace itself. And then God is speaking through your form and there's no I left to uh, claim ownership of anything other than that supreme being. That's like, speaking of Ramana Maharshi, I mean, it, 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 my understanding of his state is that there was nobody left there and anybody interacting with him was actually, it was the Divine Mother speaking through him and he was gone, he was Brahman. There was nothing there for him that, you know, the, all the karma was finished and all the mind was finished and he was established as Brahman itself, changeless pure awareness which knows no subject and no object. Mm. But the Divine Mother was interacting through his form to serve the devotees um, but there was no I there left. Yeah, uh, some people say that there's got to be some remnant. In fact, I read an article by Amna, Amma in which she says that you sort of um, take on the semblance of an ego in order to function in the world. And, mm -hmm. the, and the Sanskrit term is lesha vidya, faint remains of ignorance. But you need some kind of semblance of ego in order to do anything. Uh, but yeah. but it, it's, it's, no, it's no longer running the show. Right. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. And, Ra and Ramana, you know, he liked to read the newspaper and he, he sort of listened to the radio and keep up with current events. I mean, he had personal interests still as a human being, which made well, difference. Well, that might, I mean, that, on the one hand, even though he was doing all those things, you know, it's like Nisargadatta says, well, you, somebody said to him, yeah, but I see you smoking. He said, well, that's what you see, but that, you have no <laughs> idea what I experienced. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't know. We could argue on that one, but it's kind of esoteric. But anyway, whatever that is. It is, but it's practical in a way because a lot of teachers keep hammering on, you know, completely eradicating the ego. And if, if the ego is something that actually never does get completely eradicated, but just gets put in its proper place, then, you know, maybe people have a more realistic um, evaluation of where they're at, you know, and, what, and where they should yeah, be at. Yeah, I guess at. that's why I'm, 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 I'm reluctant to accept it, but because I want the complete eradication of the ego. I want nothing left here but the Supreme Reality. I, I want to merge fully in Brahman now, not after death. Thank you. I want it now. I want that supreme eradication, you know? Yeah. It's just a yeah. question of whether you could actually function as a human being if, if it were completely eradicated. And maybe it's, we're kind of nitpicking. Uh, and, you know, but I'm just suggesting that the ego is a faculty which has kind of usurped its, its you know, the, it's sort of like a, 
kind of a, a servant sort of sitting up on the king's throne where he doesn't belong and uh, saying, I am the king. Yeah. So the, in, in most yeah. cases, the ego is sort of is running the show, but doesn't <clears throat> deserve to be. But it still has its function. It's just, it has a much more subsidiary function than it actually sh sh ends up having in most people's lives. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That kind of thing. <clears throat> <laughs> um, <laughs> and getting back to something you were saying a little bit earlier about how glorious it is to sit on the stage with Amma and, and bask in her radiance and all, um, you know, if, if that that might sound a little poetic, or it might sound like like the the ravings of a of a you know lovesick devotee or something like that. But if anyone listening to this has never had that kind of experience of sitting in close proximity to a genuine saint and and experiencing the the energy in that atmosphere, the darshan as it's called, you know, I highly recommend seeking that out and having that experience because it really is profound and, and significant and, and evolutionary. I mean, I know people that have undergone profound awakenings, you know, just, just sitting like that in, in that atmosphere. Uh, and, 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 you know, it's, it's kind of commonly understood that uh, some, there's this sort of transmission thing that can happen ar around enlightened beings. Um, and uh, but it's it's definitely a real phenomenon. I just want to say that it's not just some kind of romantic mood that you've gotten yourself in here. No, definitely, it's a real phenomenon, and, and anybody can experience it to some extent when you come to Siyama. Yeah. Everyone can have their, you know will have their own individual experience, and who knows what they'll what they'll see or what they'll experience. But it certainly is a very 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 palpable. I think nobody can come up and receive a hug from Mama and not be affected in, in some profound way, even if they don't know it. Yeah. And as I say, I've never been to the ashram, but people say that the whole ashram kind of has that atmosphere to a, prof to, a, to a profound degree. Yeah, it's a beautiful place. I mean, it's the place of her birth, and mm -hmm. it's the place where she, she cried buckets of tears for God when she was a girl. You know, and so there's something, there's something in the soil there that is just extraordinary. And, uh, but there's a purity there, and definitely a protection. Yeah, yeah I love the place. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I mean, here this this little girl grew up in a poor fishing village, and on and you know on the coast of Kerala, and uh, ended up having to leave school after the fourth grade to help with family chores and stuff, and you know just kind of blossomed into this world figure, and and you know with this huge following all over the world, and this huge ashram kind of springing up in that spot you, you got to figure there's definitely something behind that it's it's you know not something that's going to happen to the average kid who grows up in an Indian fishing village right I mean and this is a very low caste in India the fishing the fishing caste and, and a, a little girl you know in India women are expected to be out of sight for the most part unless you happen to be born in the Gandhi family <laughs> um, or marry into it, but um, but the fact that a little girl with a fourth grade education from a very low caste in India has become a global celebrity and a, a source of this huge charitable mission is amazing. And she speaks at the UN. She's given speeches all over the world. So it's it's quite something. It can't it can't just be um, a matter of some personal charisma or something like that. It's much bigger than that. Mm. So we've been talking about enlightenment um, and. And you know, people in the ashram, and you mentioned earlier that you feel like a lot of them are a lot more advanced than you, or something. Um, and I know, given the culture around Amma, no one's going to be broadcasting their enlightenment if it's happened, or their realization, or their awakenings, or anything else. People are probably all kind of discreet about it. Um, but um, do you feel? Do you have the sense that there are people there who really have undergone profound abiding? awakenings, you know, whether or not we want to call them enlightenment, but who've really shifted into profoundly higher states of consciousness in a stable way as a result of their whole well, involvement. There's definitely, yeah, I would say at least one Swami definitely comes to mind. I won't say his name, but um, he, the, the look on his face is extraordinary. Is it's that the guy who plays the flute and has the thing That's pulled up over his... I know, I totally, like, he's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So uh, um, he looks definitely like an enlightenment that's already happened, but that's just being kept under wraps. He really does. I'd like to interview that yeah. guy if he'll, if he'll <laughs> agree to it. Um, yeah. 
I think we'll see a number. I think we really will see a number of enlightenments there. Yeah. You wonder, I mean, in terms of Amma's mission, do you feel like um, her mission is, may, maybe it's just multi-pronged, uh, you know, project, but on the one hand there's the alleviation of suffering, you know, the, the widows and the orphans and the prostitutes and the mm -hmm. suicide farmers and all the stuff she tries to, to do to, you know, tsunami victims to just al al to alleviate basic human suffering. And then there's this whole theme that we're talking about of higher consciousness and enlightenment and so on. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like sh that she has a priority one way or the other or is she just multitasking and, and covering both of these bases with one with one effort? Do you feel like the actual alleviation of suffering is just a tool she uses to help her devotees? In other words, give them something, some sort of selfless service to do so as to attenuate their egos and further their evolution? Or, you know where I'm going with this question? Or is it sort of like killing two birds with one stone and both things are equally legitimate and one serves the other? No, I think it's a good question, but I think for sure that um, both of them are equally legitimate and, and they do serve each other naturally. Mm -hmm. But Amma's, Amma's concern for the suffering of the people in the world is very real and very sincere and very intense. Yeah. She sees them all as her own self and she knows, oh my God, that's God in suffering in this human form and, and doing everything she can to alleviate that suffering. It seems to me that this is one of the most beautiful and full expressions of Advaita that the world has ever seen. Um, and at the same time, she's giving an opportunity to serve to thousands and thousands of devotees from around the world. And, you know, as, as time goes on, it's like her mission reaches out to more and more and more people. And the way they do that is by, by these service projects. Because mm. if you talk about God and you talk about Advaita, you're going to get 0.01% uh, understanding what that's about in the world. And, and you right. talk about, oh, a divine incarnation, and people go, oh, God, that, does, that sounds weird. I don't want to hear about that. You know, don't tell me that. But if you tell, tell people about beautiful charitable projects which are serving the poor, which they can verify as being legitimate, then they go, oh, I can, I can help that. I can come and teach in the university, or I can come and work with tribal women and help them. And so this brings in more and more people. And as you enter the service of Amma and the service of humanity, this, this enables you to receive Amma's grace. And so it enables more and more people to come in and become involved and give whatever talent they have and whatever level of, of knowledge they have and whatever spiritual level they may be at, it doesn't matter. They're all welcome in to come in and, and, and serve. And so, it, and, you know, so this, this is benefiting hundreds of thousands of people who are doing service, volunteering in some level. And, and I think it's also genuinely benefiting millions of people who are suffering in the world. So, and I don't think that Amma sees a difference between her disciples and the people suffering in the world. They're all her children, and it's, she's doing whatever she can to alleviate our suffering. And she knows, of course, that the, the ultimate uh, way to alleviate suffering is to, teach, is to bring us to enlightenment. Mm -hmm. That's the only real, that's the end of suffering, and everything else is relative degrees of suffering. But she's, she's reaching out to whoever, and, uh, who, whoever she can reach with the best method she can to alleviate their suffering at whatever level it's manifesting. Oh, I think she's just amazing. That's a good answer. Um, yeah, well, while you were saying that, I was thinking, yeah, well, you know, suffering is not, it, 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 there's a continuum, you know, from have, having had your house washed away by a tsunami and, and you know, shivering in the cold, that's, that's one level of suffering, or being a, a sex slave in Mumbai or something, to, uh, you know, being a highly evolved person, but still being kind of caught up in, in, uh, in ignorance. And, you know, there's still a, a degree of suffering there. And so I, I guess I'm just yeah. sort of dealing with people at whatever level they're at and kind of hopefully, hopefully moving them along the scale toward ultimate elimination of suffering. Right. Sure. Yeah. And as I said, it's an, an expression of Advaita. It's, it's like, I mean, I think Ramana is at one, one side of the scale. Maybe, I know, I, I'm not sure that I want to say that, but it's like Ramana sat in a cave and he was in silence and he did very little on the physical plane to alleviate suffering. And some, you know, some are, you know, established and look, you know, I see no one. There is no one but the Supreme Reality. I see no one suffering. Mm -hmm. Ramana said, well, you know, if you see someone hungry in your dream, then yes, go ahead and feed them. But when you wake up from the dream, then you see there's no one suffering, it was just a dream, so there's no need to do anything. You, you are the only reality. Brahman alone is real and that never suffers. 
So that's one, one side of the scale. Ama takes that full realization of Brahman and says, yes, this is all my children, all is Brahman, and every bit of suffering is, is the suffering of God. Let me, let me go serve. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, both are beautiful, both are full, and yet I must say this is amazing what Rama is doing. And I, I rather prefer the, the, the vision that says, you know, yeah, sure, let me have the bliss of Brahman, and also let me go out there and serve the, the, the poorest of the poor with all my energy and all my love and with full courage, because I know I am Brahman. I am therefore fearless in my service of, of humanity, and I can manifest huge compassion. I mean, I love that. It's... it's, it's it's courageous to, to walk with great compassion among the, the suffering and take their suffering upon yourself. I love that. Mm. Yeah, and I guess we, with regard to Ramana or anybody else, different saints have different roles to play. You know, they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're just wired differently, have different dharmas. Um, yeah. But one thing, one thought that's been coming to mind the last few minutes is that for Rama, this is not some kind of merely altruistic uh, effort that, you know, she conceives of intellectually as being important or some such thing. I mean, she really feels the suffering of people. I, I've seen so many cases, I'm sure you have also, of people coming to her whose husband just died or who, whose husband had been beating them or, you know, some, something that's really yeah. causing suffering. And Amma's tears are stra streaming down her face. She, she commiserates yeah. with them in a very personal way. And, you know, a minute later, somebody else can be coming and cracking a joke and she'll be laughing uproariously. So she doesn't get yeah. stuck in any one state, but she's, right. she's definitely, her heart is so involved in, in each person that interacts with her. Yeah. I, you know, one of the books I wrote for children is called The Awakening of Wendy the Wave. And basically it's conveying the image that the, uh, our true self is like the ocean of consciousness. And the... the the so-called separate souls are like waves that float on the surface of the ocean. Mm -hmm. And the waves don't, don't even know that there is an ocean, most of them. <laughs> but uh, they think they're separate, and they think they're a Mr. and Mrs. Wave. And, um, but uh, a wave like Ama has realized that, in fact, she is the ocean. She has merged in the ocean and discovered her true being to be the ocean. Mm -hmm. And that ocean is fully present within every wave. So that when we come up to her, it's not like she's meeting a stranger. She's meeting herself, and she fully, fully knows every detail of our personal life, knows all of our suffering, knows all of our pleasure and all of our pain. And, and she is so fully with us in our life, so that it's just like there's no, there's no distance between Ama and wherever we might be in our life. She's fully with us already. She's already always within us, always hearing our thoughts. So this is why when somebody comes up before her, you know, the tears flow because she's in that person. There's no separation. This is one one concept. No, I think you're right. I'm, that's my experience with her. That she she really tunes in and um, you know knows you very intimately, knows things about you that you don't you yourself don't know or that you haven't told anybody or whatever, and and just. Um, responds in those few moments that you're with her in, in such a way as to help to move you along, to, re to re remedy the situation or to protect you from some harm you might be in, <laughs> doing to yourself or about to do, yep. or yeah. you know, all kinds of situations. Everyone is different, yeah. but it's, it's really remarkable. I think remarkable. she's taking, her, taking your suffering onto herself in those moments also. You know, when you see her with tears streaming down the face, it's, she's taking your suffering. And in those tears that she's shedding on your behalf, she may be taking years of pain from you. So you yeah, I mean, that's an interesting point in itself. I mean, if she is taking your suffering, then obviously the ocean can absorb a lot of dirt, you know, before it gets muddy. Uh, whereas, whereas a glass of water can't absorb very much before it gets muddy. Uh, and Ahmad herself, on, on a personal level, experiences a lot of suffering. I mean, physically she's in severe pain from this repetitive motion injury of, of hugging 30-something million people. Uh, you know, she has diabetes, she has, uh, you know, various physical difficulties, some problems with her lungs and so on. So she's, she's not like the epitome of physical health, and yet she continues to do this thing to, uh, with, and shows very little evidence of, uh, uh, you know, of 
uh, of what she's going through. I mean, I think if any of us were yeah. to actually experience what she's experiencing physically without being her, without having her level of consciousness, we'd yeah. be like in bed flat, you know, with calling yeah, for the we'd doctor. We'd probably be instantly dead, actually, <laughs> the amount of karma she's carrying. Yeah. But she's never canceled the darshan program, even though she may be bearing tremendous pain. She just never shows it. I mean, maybe at the end of a darshan, she'll get up and, and go, oh my God, she can barely walk for a few steps. But then four or five steps later, she's just, again, radiant. You know, yeah. After one hour of sleep, she'll do the same thing again the next day. So there's something superhuman going on there. There is. I mean, I've, said her, I've seen yeah. her have to interrupt the program to go and, and vomit, you know, because she was physically sick, and then come right back and keep smiling and doing it for quite a few more hours. <laughs> the rest of us would have said, you know, it's off for the... I heard Amma say a recent, uh, an interesting quote recently, uh, in, I think it was her Christmas message this year, New Year's message, she said, she said, you know, once Amma gives something, she can never take it back. Uh, so that she's given her life to the world, and she's just not going to, you know, be an Indian giver, so to speak, <laughs> pun intended, mm -hmm. and, and take it back once it's given. So she's just going to carry on like this, regardless of her physical experience or, you know, whatever. It was mm -hmm. actually in the context of something where she had to be put in the hospital for a few days because she was having such a hard time of it. And, um, and yeah, anyway, that's the point. Mm -hmm. Uh, my wife Irene just passed me a note. She just wanted me to mention that she she herself has has had many experiences of Amma's kind of all knowing nature, or omniscience. Um, you know, you, you have. I have, I have had. Uh, and uh, anyway, obviously this is an interview in which we're just kind of a couple of Amma devotees talking to each other, you know, and, and <laughs> saying all this stuff. Kind of, yeah. Uh, but anyway. Um, there are probably th there are thousands and thousands of people who could say what I, you know what Irene just said that it's it's kind of a remarkable phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about you a little bit more. I mean, your book is really interesting, and you have kind of a wild and crazy and interesting background of all the stuff you've been through over the years. Um, if you feel that that wouldn't detract from the conversation we've been having, it might. Put it no, more in, more into a context. Um, yeah. You know, the subtitle of your book, "My Wild and Crazy Ride to Here and Now." There is there is a sort of divine madness, I think, that many people go through on the spiritual path, where you know you you're no you no longer have the stable moorings of uh, you know conventional life in the world that, and you kind of cast those moorings free and, and begin to float on an on un, unknown ocean to mix metaphor, you know, same metaphor more or less. And yeah. you know, you can go through years and years and years of pretty crazy stuff as your life gets rearranged uh, yeah. on, on the inside and your outer life might appear to be rather dysfunctional, uh, you know, rather, yeah. rather nutty, rather unconventional, yeah. and you don't care because you're so fixated, so focused on the inner metamorphosis that that you're trying to go through. So that that in a way is the the theme of your book, I would say, isn't it? Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. It, I had a very very intense spiritual awakening when I was young. I, it went from when I was about 21. Tell us about I it. I went from from basically from cynical atheist to deluded prophet within about six months. <laughs> so uh, you know, I was studying theater in in a theater conservatory college, the State University of New York at Purchase. And I was really a cynical atheist. I had decided when I was in, in my mid-teens that this whole religion thing was just baloney. I was raised in, in a Protestant family. We went to church and we did not believe any of it. I mean, it was like they wanted us to become very good. It was about morality, but we were very clearly told we don't really believe this stuff about G the miracles of Jesus. That's just a myth that was made up. Science is the truth. And so I rather rather fully embraced atheism. By the time I was uh, 16, 17, I was absolutely not buying any of this stuff. And um, well, when I was in college, I was trying to become an actor and I was very unhappy and so I was in psychotherapy trying to get to the root of my misery and to try to find the root of some new talent, which could turn me into a new Marlon Brando. <laughs> and um, 
and in, in, in theater classes, doing all this emotional expression and, and all this physical work to free the voice and all these emotion things coming up. And I was looking at my childhood and all the things that had happened. And, and at some point I started smoking marijuana. And I think it was these three things, the psychotherapy and the theater and the marijuana that began to uh, culminate in these epiphanies where suddenly I began to see the whole world in a new light and a new understanding would dawn on me and this might last for two or three days and then it would fade and, and then maybe a couple of weeks later I'd have another one and I, it was pretty extraordinary. And this got culminated in one night, the whole, the whole mind kind of collapsing and suddenly God was speaking to me. And the God who I hadn't even believed existed just a week before is speaking to me in great clarity and, and showing me tremendous uh, truths that I just had no clue existed. Um, numerology, um, yin and yang, uh, there, was a, there was a discovery in me somehow, I don't know from, from a past life or what, but yin and yang came into me like a seed and um, showed me a vision of the supreme reality which, which, which encompassed all and transcended all. And suddenly, this supreme reality was speaking to me, and um, so it was it it it, it uh, put me in a whole new territory. And no one in my life knew anything about this stuff. N no one who I knew really even believed in God. Really, maybe there were people who were religious, but there wasn't any sense of anybody actually in direct contact with God. No, no one knew about it, and I was in direct contact with God, and it was so real and so powerful and so incredibly exciting that it was like a, a complete non sequitur to everything in my life at that time. There was no one I could turn to for advice because no one knew about it, at least it, it, as far as I knew. And um, with the, the ignorant childhood you know, that, that I had, I had little, I did not know there was a spiritual path. I didn't know anything about saints. I didn't know there was enlightenment. I didn't even know about the Catholic saints. This was my upbringing. We didn't know anything. We knew Jesus was the only divine being who'd ever come to the planet. And then there were 2,000 years of spiritual drought. And suddenly, me, I had been chosen to be <laughs> in, in contact with God. And um, I had a very powerful experience of meeting an angel. Uh, that's quite a story. It's in the book. and. Um, and you, you feel uh, like telling it, or you want to like leave leave that as well, a teaser it's, for the it's book? Rather, rather, rather too subtle to be told very quickly. Okay. Um, but I I was uh, taken to a mental hospital afterwards by by the campus security because I had gone out to meet the angel in in the middle of winter barefoot and wearing my my uh, biblical bathrobe. <laughs> and that I met the angel by God, and the angel's name was Serenity, and it was a very very profound moment of uh, uh, discovery of that which is beyond time. It was such a first meeting with the guru, you know, I don't know what it was really, but it was a, an extraordinary divine experience. And then, you know, I was taken to a mental hospital and rapidly talked my way out of the place. I think I spent an hour in the lobby and that was it. But um, for, for quite a while, I thought, well, I must be the Messiah because God has chosen me and I just met an angel and God is speaking to me and I have this incredible communion happening with the divine is speaking to me through all these signs and I'm like fully, I must be, what explanation could there be other? And this was the, I guess the problem of growing up in a culture that had, that was completely ignorant as far as the divine reality. But, um, so this was, this was my awakening and it was very dramatic and, um, I was quite deluded for about six months and I was smoking a lot of marijuana. Marijuana was kind of key to, to my experience of, of God at the time. And I want to just, when I say that, I want to point out I have, I quit smoking marijuana and doing any kind of drugs 30 years ago. So it's, I, it's not part of my, my path anymore at all. But in the beginning, it was very key. And um, when I would smoke a joint, in those days, I would glow with a visible light so that people who did not see auras would suddenly see an aura around me. And it was kind of exciting. I mean, people would treat me as if I was the Messiah. Mm. People would talk to me as if, oh my God, you're him, aren't you? You've come. And, um, 
And even when, when uh, I was clean shaven and had painted my face with a hideous design, uh, I was at my brother's um, university visiting him and they were having a party and somehow Vietnam War themed party. I painted my face in red and black and told everybody I was the ghost of all the dead Vietnamese. But uh, when I smoked a joint um, and got my usual glow happening, one of, the, one of the fraternity brothers looked at me for a few minutes and he said, it's cross time, isn't it? Hmm. And I said, yeah, you have good eyes, man. <laughs> so there were many, many experiences of this kind. And it wasn't just light, it was also energy that would fill a whole room. So it was, it was really weird. It was, it was a really weird kind of awakening. It was somehow, I don't know, from what past life, I you know, got this weird awakening. But it took me, you know, and, and I did six months of that and then fell into a suicidal depression where I began to see myself as someone who had gone crazy and I've lost all my friends and I thought I was, why I thought I was, what? I thought I was the Messiah, I must be a complete nutcase, complete failure, suicide is the best option here. Um, bum, maybe, you know, um, but... Uh, so I suffered very much, and then I came back out of that into another six-month Messiah trip. And uh, had all kinds of amazing experiences. Um, and then fell back again into another depression. And then it was at the end of the second depression that I came out of that and discovered meditation. And I discovered um, the book of Yogananda, Autobiography of a Yogi. And um, this was the beginning of the end of my insanity. So my delusion fell away completely very quickly. I quit smoking weed altogether and um, quit smoking cigarettes very quickly. And meditation proved to be, you know, okay, this is clean. It gives me what I need spiritually. It gives me a, a glow, maybe not quite so visibly as marijuana, but it, boy, it was, it was very sweet. And so I was like, okay, this is the beginning of the end of my craziness. And now I'm on the spiritual path. Let me see if I can find my guru. And I, you know, then discovered the books of Ram Das about Neem Karoli Baba and had many subtle experiences with Neem Karoli Baba. So I knew, I mean, I'm being guided by a um, God realized being. I don't know who my guru is, but I trusted Neem Karoli Baba was going to guide me to my guru. And, uh, and then I met a, a beautiful girlfriend who wanted to practice tantric sex. And so we did some of that, and that was very healing. And I studied the Course in Miracles for a couple of years, and that was very empowering. And healing wasn't fully my path, um, but it was it was it was beneficial. And then after this, I met Amar. And um, it's funny because I was trusting Yim Karoli Baba to lead me to my guru. And the night that I realized that Amar was my guru, Ramdas, the American, the famous American teacher, came to see Amar in Boston. And when he was lying in Amma's lap, receiving her embrace, and she put flower petals over his head, and uh, there was suddenly a, a little epiphany. Oh, Amma and Neem Karoli Baba are one being. And we were in a church that night, and there was a banner of the Holy Spirit. And, oh, Amma embodies the Holy Spirit. And then the cross is there. Amma embodies Christ. And it suddenly, it was like the whole universe was saying, yes, she embodies all the forms of God. All the masters you've ever read of, she is your guru, and this is why you've come to the earth. And so I'm having this huge divine revelation of, oh my God, oh my God, I want so much to be called by her. Yes, she's my guru, but shouldn't she tell me so? So I went up in the darshan queue, burning with this desire to be called by her. And when she gave me the hug, she whispered in my ear, join us. And, it, it, you know, joining is an essential concept in The Course in Miracles. You join with your brother to discover that there's really only Christ in both of you. And hearing her say, join us, it was like, it wasn't even in Indian English. It was a, an accentless English. It was like, there was no doubt God was speaking directly through her and she was God. And it was an explosion that, it was like the end of the old life, beginning of the new life. I was ready to take a new name. I was ready to leave everything. And my God, I found God incarnate. And it was this beginning of huge love. And it put the whole uh, Messiah trip I had been through and all the suffering I had been through in a whole new perspective. And um, I fell completely in love with Amma. 
And it, I guess that love has continued ever since. And um, only gotten deeper and deeper and deeper. And my experience of who and what she is has only gotten deeper and deeper and deeper. The more and more full, the, the revelation that she's actually God in a human disguise has just become more and more strong. So that's 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 the summary of it, uh, of it, and it's a very funny story how you know how I overcame my Messiah delusion, <laughs> and all the little experiences I had along the way, and um, it's a fun book. It's um, I'll just hold up the the book cover. Sure. Rising in love, my wild and crazy ride to here and now with Amma the hugging saint. Um, it is a, a lot fun of book. fun. Yeah, you're a good writer. It's a fun it's book and. Fun. And there's, there's all kinds of interesting little stories in it, um, you know, just different uh, cosmic little events, you know, that, that, that help to, I think, convince people that, you know, there is more to life than, than meets the eye and that someone like Amma could, could exist, who could know things and do things that, um, you know, ordinarily people don't know or do, uh, you know, there's just there's a little insightful connection kind of things that I, I, I don't know, I thought it was very beautifully depicted. It's a fun book and people are, I'm getting a lot of really positive feedback. People who I don't know on Twitter are writing me and saying, oh my God, I laughed hysterically and cried throughout your whole book. Yeah. And somebody else saying, my chakras were opening, my mind is racing, I'm having an awakening just from reading your book. <laughs> and there have been like five or six people saying, I received Dhamma's Darshan through your book. Cool. Oh, that's pretty damn amazing. Yeah. You I, know, what happened recently, which was really fun, is that Russell Brand mm -hmm. came to the ashram at New Year's. Mm -hmm. And um, I happened to be giving prasad, sitting next to Amma, passing her the candies, when he came up and received a mantra from mm -hmm. Amma. And I thought, that, I, Russell Brand getting a mantra, that's pretty cool. And some little light bulb went in my head. Oh, I bet he would really like my book. Mm -hmm. So I... I better not miss this opportunity. He might be here only one more day. So I, I, I went and wrapped up the book and put a letter in it. And the next day, I happened to find him at just the right moment and gave him a big, beautiful hug. And we had a very nice couple of minutes together. And, and you know, I gave him the book and said, Ah, oh, I'm going to check this out. <laughs> and um, a couple of days later, he posted a photo of himself reading the book on Twitter and Facebook to a combined audience of 11.7 million people. So this has suddenly got this global um, publicity going. It's uh, fantastic publicity. Yeah, I mean, did you notice a big spike in book orders at that point? You know, I haven't, I honestly haven't been checking. Uh -huh. I haven't been following the book orders so closely. Yeah. Yeah, I'm hoping that Russell read the, my introduction to your book so that- uh, I'm sure he did, yeah. So that somehow or other it'll enable me to do an interview with him. I'd love to do that. He's a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Um, a lot of a lot of your book, not a lot, but you know, a fair amount of your book has to do with your various struggles with relationships. You know, your attempt to be celibate, and then various relationships you went through, and then your marriage, and and uh, you know, some of the difficulties you faced in your marriage. Um, you you want to talk about that kind of thing a little bit because a lot of people. You know, yeah. every, everybody has this in their life, and it and a lot of people and. People appreciate hearing somebody else's take on how to how to deal with it all. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, um, there was when I when I met Amma. When I first met Amma, I was actually in a relationship with a woman. This is the woman that we were practicing some tantric sex, and that mm -hmm. was very beautiful. And I liked her, and she, and she liked me, and we were thinking, well, maybe we should get married. But after I had been with her for about a year, I was feeling actually very full, as if, you know, I'm really not that interested in sex anymore. It's like, it's okay, but it's like, when you haven't had it, there was that huge hunger for it, you know? And that, but once I'd had it, and I had a very fulfilling um, sex life with, with practicing Tantra together, and I was like, wow, then it suddenly I didn't really care that much about it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what I really wanted was the, to find out what these yogis in Autobiography of the Yogi had found. I wanted to become a monk and live in India. So, um, so it, when I then you know, told Amma that I wanted to become a monk, at our, our, basically our, our, the, our first meeting, she, she laughed hysterically. And she laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed. And she's holding somebody on her, on her lap. And, and 
giving them a tremendous ride while she laughs and laughs like I've never seen anybody laugh before, as if this is the funniest thing. I mean, you've probably just never seen anybody with so much sexual desire saying they want to become a monk. You know, I think that was probably the root of it. I think she was also seeing my entire Messiah trip and having a great laugh about all of that also. But um, she's basically, I mean, I can tell that story. I, I suppose we have time for that. Sure, um, we have time. Yeah. Uh, she said, um, there's a name for the kind of sannyasin you would be. Sannyasin is, is monk. And I had said, I want to become a sannyasin. So she said, um, and this was being translated out loud. In those, in those days, the questions were translated in, in, for everybody. So everybody here heard the question and the answer. She said, there's a name for the kind of sannyasin you would be. When a newly married husband has his first quarrel with his wife, Sometimes they'll say, I'm leaving you and renouncing the world. And they'll put on an orange robe and go out into the town. And within a few days, he'll be winking at all the women and making all kinds of mischief. That's the kind of sannyasin you would be. <laughs> and then she said, you have a mind like a cat. No matter how much you feed it, it will always be stealing something. <laughs> and actually, this was sort of reflecting something that, you know, in, in some of my earlier years, I had actually done a little bit of mild shoplifting when I was working as a waiter in my anger and my frustration and everybody I would steal a pair of salt and pepper shakers and mm. steal it. I mean I had brought I mean it was a pro probably about fifty dollars altogether worth of stuff I had stolen. It wasn't a lot of stuff, but nonetheless it was a pretty nasty little sin. And uh, there was something about her saying oh, it will always be stealing something. I said, oh I wonder if she knows about that, you know. <laughs> There was, there was, of course, a moment earlier where I had decided I had to renounce all of those kind of wrong actions. I woke up a little bit spirituality and realized I had been really on the wrong path. But anyway, um, so I decided, I said, okay, after this darshan where she had laughed at me and you know, said basically, you're not monk material, buddy, you know, I said, wait a minute, that's the goal of my life. I want this so much. I have to have this. And then, all right, God, I'm not giving up so easily. Give me a sign. So as I was driving back home, I said, give me a sign, God. And I was driving through all these little towns um, in Massachusetts, and I kept seeing in every single town, Maple Street. Every town, I saw five or six of them. And I was like, wait a second, is that the sign? And I understood, Maple. If you really want to become a monk, you may pull for that goal, and Amma will help you. <laughs> so I got this very clear message. So I decided then and there, yes, I'm going to do it. I'm going to pull for that. Whether I succeed, I don't know, but I'm going to try. And so within a couple of months, my girlfriend and I had broken up. It just naturally kind of happened. And I uh, moved in with some friends who were doing a, a spiritual community and sort of decided to let me increase my meditation time from two hours to four hours a day and let me try to become a sannyasin. And then uh, fairly quickly, I had a rather powerful miracle from Amma. Um, I don't want to tell the whole story, but um, at a time when I was stuck in a snowdrift. Oh, that was amazing. Yeah, I read that yeah, story. It's quite a powerful story. She, she literally manifested a jack in the trunk of my car, which had a piece of candy wedged into it. Yeah, I mean, just I just read that last night, and it's like you were trying to get your thing out of the snowdrift, your car, and you you already had one jack, and you'd been working and working, and you needed two jacks to really get it out, and you'd been getting sand from a bag in the trunk, and uh, you know you couldn't get it out, so you opened up the trunk again, and there on top of the bag of sand, which you'd been getting sand out of all this time, was a new jack that hadn't been there, and it had a piece of candy wedged in it, so that was kind of amazing. It was amazing, and I knew in that moment, this is a miracle. This is like a biblical miracle I'm seeing. <laughs> it's like, absolutely, and I took the piece of candy and ate it, and, you know, it, it had a moment of ecstasy, and then put the second jack in there, and vroom, we got out with, without any more struggle. Yeah. So this was definitely a sign that there's very powerful grace here. Um, but to get back to the relationship question, so then I was, I was determined to become a monk, and so... There were, you know, some, some ladies in the, in the town where I was living there in Massachusetts who were winking at me and sort of, hey, would you like to have dinner with me? Are you sure? You know, uh, and, and I was like, I'm so sorry, but I'm going to become a sannyasin. So I pushed that away and ended up going to Amas Ashram and, um, as a brahmachari with the determination, I'm going to become a sannyasin. I wanted so much to be a brahmachari. 
And um, for a couple of years, it was, it, I, you know, I was just very um, engulfed in the ashram life. I was doing my best to meditate all day and, and do seva and be fully absorbed in, in the amasin. And I didn't have much difficulty with sexual desire. It was kind of a bit of grace for mama. And then I went through a period of suddenly very, very intense lust and uh, struggling with it very intensely. And there was one woman in the ashram and I think she wanted to have a kid. And I felt like, oh my God, I'm so in love with this woman and she's so in love with me and I'm going absolutely crazy. I was trying to push it away. No, I don't want that. And yet all night long, I'd be, oh my God, I want that, I want that, I want that. And so I suffered very much. And it's, that's a you know, funny chapter in the book where I really wanted to get married and, and um, Surrendering all that to Amma and praying to Amma for her help and her guidance and you know giving her a series of notes where I said Amma take this away. I don't want any of that. I want to become I want only God realization and then a week later Amma I will marry anyone you say um, you know uh, So rapidly uh, crumbling discrimination and renunciation there and then finally You know Amma, Amma gave the, the final answer to the question which was don't change your path hmm. It was just kind of in, in, in code saying, um, stay celibate. Keep on trucking, yeah. Keep on trucking. And so I not went the through. Not the opposite thing, which rhymes with trucking. Right. That's right. Absolutely. That's not what the way for it. <laughs> At that moment, anyway, she didn't give that guidance. So I <laughs> cried a puddle of tears. And, um, and then, you know, fairly quickly accepted that this was God's guidance on the matter and let the relationship idea go and um, you know got busy writing a new play for him I was writing plays for her in those days which we would perform in, on the US tour you know let, and, let, let's just have you interject let me just interject a question have you elaborate on this there are people who say you know this whole thing about being celibate and I don't know, being a monk and all that stuff has nothing to do with realization it was just some kind of cultural you know, male-dominated society issue that, that crept mm -hmm. into spirituality and that it, it's really irrelevant. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, just do what you like in that, in that department and it won't make any mm -hmm. difference as far as your realization. Uh, so how would you address that? And, and, you know, how would you justify the, the determination with which you yeah. tried to maintain a you know, celibate lifestyle? <laughs> Well, I, I should probably, before I do that, I should probably just tell you a little bit of the rest of my story around this question is that uh, at one point, I actually left Amma's organization. As guided by Amma on the inner plane, I left and I went to several other gurus. I spent actually seven years outside of the ashram. Mm -hmm. I would come to see Amma every few months, but I was not in the organization anymore. And um, towards the end of that time, I was brought together with a young woman. Another guru brought us together. And we decided to get engaged, and um, we ended up coming back to Amma's ashram, and Amma married us. Uh -huh. So, um, and we've been living together at Amma's ashram for the last 13 years, and we haven't been celibate. In fact, we went to her, and at one point I said, Amma, you know, I, I maybe would like to become celibate now. We can be brother and sister living together. And my wife was like, I don't want that. Come on, I want I want a full sex life. And Amma told. Um, no, you should not be celibate. You're married and you have to fulfill this for your wife and accept. So it was like we were very specifically guided to, to not be celibate and to live a normal married life. And um, I have to tell you that my spiritual life has only gotten better since then. Mm -hmm. And were you able uh, to do that without any kind of hang up or conflict? I mean, since you had browbeaten yourself so severely for so many years over the celibacy yeah. thing, were you able to just sort of relax on it and put it behind you and just live a normal sex life? Or, or were you still kind of a little inhibited or hung up? There was, I think there was a transition there, but it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't a long transition. Uh -huh. I like sex. I'm, I mean, I've always been very, very sexual in my thinking. I grew up as a normal American kid. And, um, you know, I mean, when I was in high school, I think sex was probably 90% of the contents of my mind. So, <laughs> As with most know, high school kids. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, and celibacy is very foreign to my nature, really. So, so to come back into having a very fulfilling sex life has been just, just sweet and natural, really. It's mm -hmm. been very nice. And, you don't I mean, find it point, draining or anything like that? No, I don't. I don't. And I mean, I, I mean considering that you know, now I'm having these wonderful meditation samadhi experiences, I have to agree with these people who say it really doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I'm very glad that I 
spent the early years with Amma as a brahmachari and struggled and struggled to because basically you're it's a it's a form of prayer which is I want God more than anything in this world and it is a powerful channeling of all your energies and I think you know if that, if there are many times when you know a young man will will spend most of his energy seeking sex, seeking, seeking a new partner, and then, you know, they break up and he gets all engrossed in the emotional drama of that and then eventually finds another partner and then there's no time for God. And when you're being, like, you know, when you're having a lot of sexual pleasure, you don't necessarily have much energy left to seek God. So I think there's a value in both ways. Mm -hmm. I'm glad I spent years struggling with it and years um, as, as a celibate seeking, seeking, seeking. But now to have the fulfillment of the marriage and also to have beautiful samadhi experiences like this is this is great. I mean, I have the best of both worlds, and I'm very content with with God's gift. I mean, you know, can't be unhappy with with this lifetime. It's been fantastic. Great. Yeah. And uh, in your notes that you sent me, you said something about um, difficulties you faced in your marriage. Is that what you were just alluding to, or is there something else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's well. We we've we've been through tough times. It hasn't been the easiest of marriages. I think this is also comes along with the package, you know, that Amma gave gave a challenging marriage, which would make me really work to develop compassion and forgiveness and patience and you know. Um, and my wife has had her difficulties with faith at times. So there was a period where she really sort of fell out of love with Amma for a while and lost her faith in Amma and. That was very difficult for us to walk through together, mm -hmm. and Amma really, um, really helped helped us to walk through that time and kept us together. And at one point, we thought maybe we should divorce. I thought we were going to divorce, and I, and I uh, finally went up to Amma and received a hug and I gave her a note saying, "Should my wife and I divorce?" And Amma said no. Hmm. And it, you know, I'm so grateful and that she doesn't she did. always say no. By the way, no, I'm sure she doesn't. But in this case, it was very beneficial that she that she kept us together, and you know, I ended up going to Venezuela to be with my wife there for some time, and um, learning Spanish and teaching in Spanish, and it enabled a whole new level for my life, a new fulfillment. Because in English, it, the teaching thing wasn't likely to happen. In in Venezuela, suddenly, naturally, I was teaching in Spanish, and we were giving satsang, and I ended up, you know, giving this full university course in Spanish, which I wrote myself with a little help from my wife mm -hmm. and a translator. So this was opened up a whole new level of, of, of my life. So, and, and then, you know, my wife regained her faith. Nice. And, uh, yeah, so it's been very, very sweet. Yeah. Um, There's a beautiful story, if, if you don't mind, I'll just no, tell sure. a quick story about mm -hmm. how, how my wife was called by Amma that she was in, in India, her whole family was in India, in another ashram. And uh, her parents were the devotees of another saint. And her father is a writer, and he, he was uh, just finishing up his writing work for the day, and he, he was feeling really tired. He said, let me just meditate lying down before I go to sleep. And he starts feeling this very deep, unusually deep level of peace. And suddenly he, he feels like there's a, another being in the room. And he opens his eyes and he sees Amma standing in the room in a living form. Mm. And she says to him, give me your baby. And he said, mother, I have no babies. My daughters are all grown women. And she says, give me your baby, Tarimima. And then she vanishes from the room. Mm. And Tarinima is my wife's name. Right. So, and he comes out of, of his room and sees her and says, Daughter, go to Kerala at once. The Divine Mother is calling you. Huh. And this gives, I mean, this gives us a nice story because it gives a clue as to Amma's not just a nice lady giving hugs. You know, she's more in the realm of a Jesus Christ. Yeah, and there are a number of stories like that, too. I mean, if you start reading the books about Amma, there's this series called Awakened, Ch Awakened Children. And mm -hmm. uh, there are all kinds of stories like that where she'll show up and say something to somebody, and then they'll, mm -hmm. they'll come to the ashram, and she knows all about it, and it was all kind of like mm -hmm. perfect. And it's, it's pretty mm -hmm. far out, actually. It's pretty far out. And it's even, even more far out, the fact that she pretends to be just an ordinary lady. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. So why did you come back to the ashram after seven years of bopping around India, visiting other gurus? 
Well, um, I guess you would have to say it was just God's will, the whole thing, really. Mm -hmm. um, she pulled me back. It was just, it was time to come back. Um, and, and the, you know, she did it through my wife. Mm. I was with another guru. I had stayed with many different gurus, and at, the current, at that time I was living um, outside the ashram of this guru. And, you know, I said, well, the Divine Mother's put me here. And when Tarinima basically fell in love with Amma, she came down to meet Amma and fell in love with her. I said, well, okay, that's fine, but I'll, I'll go down to Amma's ashram and visit, visit Tarinima there, and I'll also have Amma's darshan. I totally still loved Amma, and I knew Amma was God. But somehow God had put me out and put, you know, put me in another situation, and I didn't see any need to change it. But... Um, but then I was going to, I would go to, to, to Tiruvannamalai for a while, then I would go down to see Ama and, and see Tarinima down there, and then I would go back to this other ashram where I was living. And I did this two or three times, and then Ama sent a note to our room, sent someone to our room to tell us that, she, what she said was, um, since Tarinima is focusing on Ama, then she should stay here. But since you're focusing on this other guru, then... It's not good for your spiritual life to be coming here and seeing Amma. It will only distract you. So you shouldn't come here anymore. Mm. If you want to come, it could only be for two days at a time. Mm. But at the same time, if you want to get married, then you can. Amma gives her blessing. Mm. So we were left with this uh, perplexing message of, oh, you can get married if you want to, but you can't, stay, you can't be together because she's going to be here and you're going to be there. So we were left with this rather confusing message. I thought, well, this has to be a Leela. I don't know what this can be, but it, it doesn't make much sense. So let's see what happens. So we went back together to see this other guru where I was living. And um, every day when he came out for his darshan, I, I suddenly began hearing very clearly from him, it's now time to return to Amma and lay your life at her feet. I heard the same message seven days in a row, and I was like, okay, I get it. It's definitely he wasn't to... saying that. You were just sort of feeling that, right? Well, it was, you know, my relationship with him was something where I would hear his voice. In the same way that I hear Amma's voice, I heard his voice very clearly, and I had no doubt that he was, I mean, it had been confirmed hundreds of times. I was less, I was receiving direct communication from him on the inner plane. Mm -hmm. So this was one of thousands of these communications where, yes, he was telling me very clearly on the inner plane, it's now time to return to Amma and lay your life at her feet. Mm. So then it was very clear that's what, what was meant to happen and we went back to Amma and, and I explained to her this is what I have received, I'm going to be coming back here now and she very quickly accepted me back in the ashram fully and so it was fairly e easily accomplished the move. Nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, well there are tons of things in your book, in your book which we could use as springboards for discussion and uh, but we've you know been going on for a while here now so Maybe we should wrap it up, but I, I want to just make sure that um, there isn't something that's important to you that you know you feel we haven't covered. Um, I always like to ask that towards the end of an interview. Is, is there anything yeah. like, you'd like to talk about that I haven't thought to ask? Well, one thing I would, I would like to mention is that all the royalties from the sale of Rising in Love will be going to Amma's um, orphanage. Mm. So I'm actually it's three orphanages. This this money will all be going to her orphanage in India. And that's so it's a charitable that's, uh, project. And it's nice because I know you don't have a lot of money. Like I asked you if you're coming to the states this summer that we might do this interview in person, and you said oh, we don't really have the money to come there. So um, it's it's nice of you that you're doing that you're donating it that way. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. I'm I'm in this. It's my whole life story in the book, and I'm really happy to just lay it all at Amma's feet. You know, I want her to take all the karma. I don't want any karma, so <laughs> I'm very happy to give all the money to the orphanage. Yeah. How do you generate money? How do you support yourself? Just these tours well, that you we organize. Have, we or something? have a couple of, sort of. Yes, the tours. The tours is is a is one main way. Mm -hmm. And um, these are really fun tours, so I, I would like to invite anybody who's interested in coming to India mm -hmm. to do tours with us. We do really five-star tours. We have beautiful, my wife selects very, very good hotels and very good transportation, and we go to the holy cities, and we go to actually meet some of the living saints in India. Mm -hmm. oh, and, I, and I give classes during the retreats about various aspects of Hinduism, and I try to convey the essence of Hinduism, so it's not just a tour of locations, it's, it's, we're trying to give the essence. Mm -hmm. 
So people are really enjoying the tours. Good. So on my, on your page on batgap.com, I'll link to whatever website presents these tours. You have some website that talks about them? Well, yeah, if you come in, I'll just hold up the website here. Um, it's, let's see, are you getting that? No. There it is. Mm, oh. oh, the Rising Not in Love really. website. Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, www.risinginlove.org. Yeah. Rising-inlove.org. And I'll be linking to that. Okay. Right. So rising-inlove.org. If you go to the, the first page, at the bottom of the page, my email address is there. Okay. So we're still putting together our English website. Mm -hmm. Previously, we were working with a Spanish website. I see. So um, we do both Spanish and English. But if you come into that uh, rising-inlove.org site, you can find my email address and contact me, and I'll send you the latest about the tours we're giving. And if you have a group, we can organize a tour, especially for you, according to your own itinerary. Hmm. And you go all over the place, north and south India, the whole thing? We do everything. Cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you like go way up to um, Gangotri or anything like that? We haven't done that yet, but we want to. Mm -hmm. We're looking at even even going into Tibet and Nepal. Cool. Well, that's yeah. a fun life you're living. We have a good life. We have so much fun. Yeah. That's great. All righty. Well, I think this has given people a nice taste of what AMA is all about through, you know, two people's perspective, primarily yours, but, and, but maybe it will um, interest people to go and see her. She, incidentally, she, she tours all over the world, so I, she'll be touring Singapore, Australia, Japan uh, pretty soon, I think, and then she comes to the States and, and uh, goes all over the place. Ama.org is the website where you can f find the tour information. Mm -hmm. And then in the fall, she goes to Europe, and then she comes back to the States, and then she tours all over India. And so um, she gets around, and uh, chances are she'll she be. Around, huh? yeah, pardon? As if she sure does get around. Huh? Yeah, she yeah. does. And uh, <laughs> I don't know how many more years she'll be able to do this. Um, you always wonder whether this might be the last year or something, because it's very arduous, uh, but she keeps mm -hmm. on doing it. So, yeah, yeah. So make hay while the sun shines. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I wish she would stay in one place only so we could have easier access to her because following after her around the world is just too difficult for me, you know. Yeah, but it's also too difficult for... But it's for... lovely that she can come, come to people's hometowns. Uh, right. She comes to Seattle at the end of May mm -hmm. and ends up on the East Coast by, what is it, end of July. Yeah, end of July. And in the meanwhile, mm -hmm. goes to... Uh, Seattle, Bay Area, Los Angeles, Santa Fe, Dallas, Chicago, uh, you know, and then up the East Coast. And she may end up coming to Atlanta one of these days soon that she said she would. But oh. it's all, next summer's tour is all sort of tentative and unannounced so far. Yeah. Yeah. And Toronto. She also goes to Toronto. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, let's wrap it up. Um, so I've been speaking with Ramdas Batshelder. Uh, who has written this book, Rising in Love, My Wild and Crazy Ride to Here and Now. I'll be linking to his website and to the book on his page on batgap.com, as well as putting up a, a bio of him. And um, you can get in touch with him, get the book if you want, and take it from there. Um, this show that you're watching is part of an ongoing series. There are about 270-something of them now. And you can find them all at batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P. Uh, you'll find their uh, past interviews menu, and under that, they're categorized. All the past interviews are categorized in various ways. There's a future interviews menu showing what's coming up. Uh, there's a donate button, which I, that's how I support being able to do this. Uh, I don't give tours. <laughs> there is a place to, to be notified of um, upcoming uh, of new interviews as they're posted. There's an email sign-up thing. And um, a bunch of other things. Explore the menus and you'll, you'll see what's there. So, so thanks, Ramdas. It's been a lot of fun. It's been really nice to talk with you, Rick. Yeah. Really a pleasure. Good. And uh, we'll hope to meet you in person one of these days. Yeah, definitely. This summer, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. that'd be great. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Talk to you later. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Om Namah Shivaya. Om Namah Shivaya.